So now it's time to take a look at our next class. So I thought a little bit about this. I got a lot of uh, good suggestions on Twitter and on YouTube. And oh, we should save this. So I'll save that for next week. May add some expansions to it. And let's take a look. The class I settled on, you know, I said I got a lot of really good um, suggestions. But what I figured what I'd like to do is show off the design for something from the Sorcerer. Uh, the Sorcerer is a really interesting class. It's definitely a class. Oh, you saw like my, oh, my downloads are right there. <laughs> the, um, it's definitely a class that has had identity issues in the game. And we know in our feedback overall, there is some unhappiness with it, especially with the class's uh, selection of spells. So this is a good example of a class where when we're doing a subclass, having that sort of metagame knowledge is really helpful. Because if you know people who want to like the class have some barriers between them and their ideal version of it, we're not at a point right now where we, we want to go back and revise the player's handbook. But what we can do is develop new subclasses that maybe start to fill some of those gaps to make you feel like, okay, this is still power level um, equal. Because we know in terms of raw output, the sorcerer is fine. The sorcerer can just cast the attack spells and, and keep up damage-wise with the characters. The issue with the sorcerer that we see is the spell selection is maybe too limited, that we just don't give you enough spells now. Now, we don't want to just come up with new sub subclasses that are equal to the other subclasses out there and they give you spells known. We actually did that in an initial playtest of the Storm Sorcerer, uh, what feels like a billion years ago, but it's probably more like three. Uh, and players loved it. And we just weren't crazy about, you know, putting out a subclass in an expansion that people really felt like, oh, if you want to play a Sorcerer, you have to play it. Play, play this subclass. It is a, it, it's a very tricky thing to solve. Because you want to make new subclasses useful and exciting, but they can't be so great that people feel like, and this is why I like to think of as a good new player scenario. New player comes to the table, says they want to play a sorcerer. Their first answer is, well, you need to buy this expansion. And that's just, mm, we don't really want to have that be the default. Now, it's okay if the player says, I want to play a sorcerer, and I really want to play a sorcerer who can command the elements. Like, they're taking that kind of next step. Then we're okay with that because we know we can't possibly offer everything that's in the, you know, the player's handbook can't hit every archetype. But if the player is thinking, like, you know, I saw in chat someone mentioned, uh, you know, the last airbender, they're thinking of a character like that, and they think, oh, it'd be cool to play a spellcaster like that. Um, then I think it's okay for more experienced players to direct them to an expansion, because the player already has a good sense of what they want to play. They're probably not as much of a beginner as someone who just doesn't know anything about D&D, or really has no real clear idea of what um, how the game's going to work. So, with all that in mind, we're going to tackle a sorcerer, and we're going to kind of look at, like, well, can we do something to kind of address those issues um, without really stepping on the toes of the, the dragon sorcerer and the, the wild sorcerer, which are the two from the player's handbook. So, um, I'm going to scroll down here and take a look at our class table. So, like the warlock and unlike the rogue, the Sorcerer's Origin, that is your subclass, that is a choice that comes in at first level. Like the Warlock, we feel like if you're saying I'm a Sorcerer, that means something important about your character, but also it really should be attached to an origin. That a Sorcerer for, for a, 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 a sorcerer with a Draconic Bloodline should just from the beginning seem different from one, say, with Chaos Magic. So this means that our, our subclass is probably going to be a little bit weightier than the Rogue, and probably about the same size as the Warlock. The one thing to keep in mind about the Sorcerer, compared to other classes, um, the Sorcerer's uh, Font of Magic feature, which uh, kicks in at second level, and Meta Magic at third level, those are a bit weightier than maybe uh, class features you might find in um, an, an classes that get a subclass choice at first level. If we scroll down and take a look at those, um, this, let's see your Font of Magic. Uh, font of Magic gives you a pool of sorcery points. The key to sorcery points is that they allow you to create new spell slots. So technically speaking, the sorcerer has more spell slots per day than the wizard. Now, the wizard has, does have a mechanic where with a short rest, you can get back some numbers of uh, spells. And that's essentially the balancing mechanism here. The key to sorcery points is you can use those whenever you want. They're not dependent on taking a rest. And then as you get higher level, once you get to, well, higher level third, um, metamagic allows you to spend sorcery points to 
alter the effects of your spells. Um, I'll go straight to the one that everyone takes. Uh, twin spell. <laughs> twin spell lets you take a spell that targets one creature and instead target um, two. So that's actually crazy useful. <laughs> and it's probably the one that people take the most often. Um, it, it allows you basically to spend a uh, sorcery point uh, equal to the, um, I believe it's the spell's level. The text is right in front of me, so we'll take a look. Yep, you can spend a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level to target a second creature. What's really powerful about this is it lets you get around the restriction on, hey, I have one action, which lets me cast one spell. This says you can use one action to cast a spell twice, and a spell that normally would cost an action. So that can be very useful. Um, and it's this is a good example of something that might be good to the point that these other features aren't really used as much because this is so powerful. Um, but that's that's a story for another day. We're talking about the core class and kind of the perception of it and how it's working. We wouldn't really try to mess with that here in subclass design because it's just, it's not really, you know, hey, we, if, if <laughs> there are more metamagic options within a subclass, I'm just, I'm not really crazy about that. Um, and I'll get into a little bit what the, the, the more detail in the why but it basically comes down to you don't want a subclass to compete with the core class for resources. And I'll, so I'll get into that a little bit more as we go further. Um, but compared to wizards, you do have this class feature that's baked into the core class that's pretty robust and as twin spell shows is very useful. So we might not have as much space compared to a wizard or a warlock, but we probably have more space than uh, the rogue. So going down to our origins, um, and again, this is a handy dandy D and D Beyond. I have all uh, my the options unlocked in this account. Uh, we get to see everything from Xenathars, including some playtest material that's uh, that's labeled as such. But we're going to go straight to Draconic Bloodline. As I mentioned last week, I always like to start with the player's handbook ones. Uh, that's our reference. We might look at the other subclasses to get a sense of what's out there uh, when we start thinking of power balance. But it's really good to start with the player's handbook because we always assume that if someone's buying an expansion. The only thing we assume they, they, they own is the player's handbook. We don't want people to feel like they have to buy every book to, to keep up with the game. So, taking a peek at first level, um, Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer uh, picks a, uh, a type of dragon. It's a chromatic dragon, the color, metallic dragon, the metal. And that, that gives you an associated damage type. So, for instance, if you were to take blue, you would get lightning. Uh, and all the other dragon types are listed here with their, their damage types. This is a little bit of a detail thing. This is also a case where we know some damage types are better than others, but we don't worry about that balancing-wise because this is a player choice. And it's also a choice now. We don't want to make it so pervasive that, like, oh, you're the, you know, if you chose, um, let's say, gold and or fire, that everything you do is fire-based. We want some things to be fire-based, but we always have to kind of think in the back of our minds, how does this character feel if you run into creatures that are immune to fire? And for instance, we know that fire is the most common elemental damage type that a creature would be immune to, as opposed to, say, acid. Um, poison is another good example. A lot of creatures are immune to poison. Um, there are constructs and, and undead that just ignore it. Um, and so this is the kind of design where it's, it's fun. Players naturally are drawn to it, but we don't want to make it so overwhelming that it becomes so defining that a very simple encounter just makes your character feel like, oh, I'm not really doing anything useful. Generally, these abilities are um, more additive rather than being the meat of your character. And you'll see that as we go through the Dragon Source Reckon, I'll point out a couple places where that, um, that comes into play. Um, you also get the ability to speak, speak, read, and write Draconic. And when you make a Charisma check when interacting with dragons, you double your pr uh, pr proficiency bonus. These are really ribbons. It's not really meant to be something that's really load-bearing. It's just something that... We figure if you meet a dragon, this is the character you'd probably ask to interact with a dragon. So it makes you feel good for doing that, for standing in front of the giant ancient red worm that could kill you in one bite, uh, for taking that one for the team. Now we get to Draconic Resilience. What we also see here is a mechanic that says, at first level, your hit point maximum increases by one, and increases by one again whenever you gain a level in this class. What this essentially means is that rather than having a d6 hit die, you have a d8. Now, obviously, you don't doesn't say change from D6 to D8, uh, and when you're recovering during a short rest, you're not getting regaining as many hit points, but it does mean your overall capacity to take damage is better than other characters. Um, we also have when you aren't when you aren't wearing armor, your AC equals 13 plus your dexterity modifier. So, baking on which actually can be with a good dexterity, a pretty pretty durable character compared to other spellcasters. Um, and this the idea behind this was to, just to get across the idea of the the, the 
the Dragon Sorcerer being more durable than other spellcasters because of that Draconic influence. So these are passive, they're pretty simple, but they're pretty useful. We do have an, um, Xanathar's I believe we talk a bit about armor. There's a lot of misconceptions about how this ability works. The idea is this essentially replaces any armor that you're wearing or could wear, or any other effect that lets you calculate your armor class as opposed to granting an AC bonus. So for instance, if you had another class feature that said, when you aren't wearing armor, your AC equals 12 plus your constitution modifier, you'd use either this calculation or the constitution modifier calculation. If you had a feature that just said you gain plus one bonus to AC, that plus one would just stack right on top of this. So that's the dragon sorcerer at first level. You feel like a dragon sorcerer, and it's something which, again, you might, it might not seem really active, but it's making your character operate differently compared to other sorcerers in a very, really notable way. You have a significantly better armor class, and you have noticeably more hit points, especially at higher levels. Coming down to sixth level, uh, you get a defensive ability. Um, the, um, oh no, sorry, reverse that. You get an offensive ability, and then a defensive ability with a sorcery point. So with Elemental Affinity, when you cast a spell that deals damage of the type associated with your ancestry, you add your Charisma modifier to one damage roll of that spell. This ability is, it's not a game changer. Um, it, in, it gives you a reason to use spells that are associated with your damage type. In power calculations, this is probably treated as uh, effectively neutral. Um, again, because we don't necessarily think of damage type as being uh, something we want to rest too much stuff on. Plus also your Charisma modifier, I mean, that's going to top out at plus five, and when it hits that, it, it's useful. I'm not going to say you don't want to use it, but it's also something that, I mean, you really want to try to associate this with a cantrip. Um, so that's kind of a nice design element that the spells you're using all the time will be tied to your ancestry. Your bigger spells, a plus five is not going to make as big of a difference as it will say on a cantrip. Then we get the second half. This is the first time we see you can spend a sorcery point to gain resistance to that damage for one hour. This is design, and I talked about this, and I kind of touched on this earlier, so now we'll go fully into it. This is a style of design we used a few times in the Player's Handbook. We used it here for the Sorcerer. We also used it on the, uh, the Way of the Elements path for the Monk, and we have found people really don't like it. The, the idea here was, you have a, a resource, let's give you a subclass that lets you use that resource in more ways. What we found though is players really overall felt that this type of ability where I can spend a resource I already have in a new way, didn't really feel like they were getting more powerful. They really felt like, well, I still only have so much fuel in the, in the tank. This is a new way to spend it, which is nice, but power-wise it just feels really power neutral because I could use my sorcery points to twin a spell and now this is competing with it. This goes back to, if you remember last week I talked about the rogue and how one of the challenges for building rogue subclasses is the core class accounts for your, your, your action, usually with a sneak attack. That's what you want to use your action to do when you're fighting someone. Your bonus action is, that's well, that's what cunning action is going to use. And that higher levels, you, have, you, you, you gained access to a defensive ability to let, let you use your reaction every round to reduce damage from incoming attacks. This is similar. You only have so much to go around for your class abilities in terms of resources where the rogue was really consuming its actions and a subclass that gave you new ways to use those actions would not be as useful, giving you new ways to spend a resource that your character accumulated just doesn't feel as useful because you're already, you're already using it, say, for twin spell. But by sixth level, you probably have a pretty good sense of the tempo or the uses you have for your sorcery points. Adding a new one, that, especially one you don't get to choose, just doesn't feel as good. Now, there is one exception to this. It's not something I'd use often, but at least I would consider it would be designed that say, let's say if you had twin spell, there might be something here that's like, hey, with this, you can spend a bunch of sorcery points and get triple spell. That's something where we know based on feedback, people are using that a lot. Well, okay, a basically the ability to break the rule to use the thing you like using and then use it even more, that might be one where it would feel, it would feel good to players because it is, you know, it's not a power up and that you're still spending your points, but it lets you take something that you're doing and then do it in a way that other characters can't. But it's also kind of sitting in that idea that if you're playing a sorcerer and you think, hey, I use my sorcery points to twin my spell, well, now I can use it to hit three targets at once, and that's really good. Now, that's also probably broken. <laughs> it's probably maybe too good. But it, that's the kind of direction we might take things, is let you break a limit with your resource that you otherwise had to, had to respect. So 14th level, um, you gain the ability to sprout a pair of dragon wings. Uh, you get a fly speed. Uh, it's a bonus action, and then you can dismiss them as a bonus action. Uh, and... 
There's also the, now this is also the kind of design which I don't think we worry about as much anymore. It says here you can't manifest your wings while wearing armor unless the armor is made to accommodate them. We, we really don't worry too much about these. Um, this is something which is, gets a little fiddly and it's not balancing anything. It's not like, well, if you're wearing armor, suddenly this is broken. It's more just there we're worried about the logic of it. But I, I don't think, I don't think this is the kind of thing we worry about as much. Then at 18th level, you get a fairly big ability. You can channel the dread presence of your dragon ancestor, causing those around you to become awestruck or frightened. That's cool, but as an action, you can spend five sorcery points. And they were already like, oh, that seems really cool, but I can do that, or I can twin a fifth level spell. I might, maybe I'd rather twin a fifth level spell. So this is another one where this is pretty good, but eh, it might not really be pulling its weight. So, the, um, what I want to do quick, I took some notes, so rather than, so we're already at 1.30, so I don't want to just go through the entire Chaos Mage, but the other one is, is the source of as well, Magic, I've got some notes here, hopefully not the sound of my pages moving and drowning everything out, but um, essentially the, what the, 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 the Wild Mage gets is uh, the, the Wild Mage mechanic at first level, where if you roll a natural one, something weird happens, and the ability to gain advantage in a die roll, um, that at you also gain the ability at 6th level, if my notes are right. I hope my notes are right. If they're wrong, chat, I'm sure chat will let me know. <laughs> but it's not its not too important for what we're doing here. Uh, you get to throw a d4 um, for a couple sorcery points and have that to a result. Um, at 6th level, you get to roll twice on the, on the wild magic table and pick the result. And uh, it looks like at 18th level, you get the ability to boost the damage of your spells. I think it's similar. I'm going to take a quick look at that because my notes are... Not all that useful. <laughs> uh, when you roll damage for a spell and roll the highest possible, number possible on any of the dice, choose one of those dice and roll it again. So, and that doesn't cost any sorcery points, unlike the Draconic one. So what we're seeing here is overall, compared to especially the Warlock, the, this, this subclass, not as, power, not as offering as much power as a Warlock subclass, but offering broader and more utility in terms of its, of its features compared to the Rogue. All right, so this is great. I've given you this entire preamble. Let's actually get to the fun part, which is let's take a look at building our subclass. So I'm gonna open up our handy dandy 5e template as I do every week. I'm gonna do select all, because this is just the filler of the uh, different styles. And I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna come straight into our heading two. And I'm gonna take a quick look back at the sorcerer, because it's trying to remember how we define soul, sorcerer's origin. So what I want to do, I thought a little bit about this. When we were doing Xanathars, we had the different elemental sorcerers that people seem to really like, but um, their playtesting was like, wasn't quite where we wanted it to be. And I thought a little bit about that, and I also thought about I had a suggestion, a couple of people coming on Twitter, for doing giant soul. So basically this is a sorcerer who ties back uh, into a some sort of uh, maybe a bloodline or the influence of giants. The really fun thing about this is that the um, when you think of giants, we have multiple giant types. We have hill giants, uh, frost giants, fire giants, storm giants, and cloud giants. Um, so this is a subclass that we'd actually you know we could make a separate subclass for each giant type. Or what I'm going to try to do here is create a single subclass that gives you a couple options. Um, if you're familiar with the Barbarian, the, the, the Totem Path, uh, that lets you choose different animals at different levels. So we're going to do something similar here. Um, build out a subclass that offers you choices uh, at certain levels. You get to choose what kind of giant soul sorcerer you want to be. And this might give us a way to kind of get an elemental sorcerer without having a lot of cluttered subclasses. And maybe give us a theme that maybe connects a bit better than just generic elementals. I thought about doing a genie themed one, but I think that I like the idea of a genie uh, being a pact that a warlock could take. So maybe once we get through our character classes, we'll go back around and uh, do another warlock subclass with uh, that relates to genies, the different types of genies. So um, flavor text would go here. I'm gonna just basically kind of give you an over overview of what I was thinking. When I think uh, giant soul, what I think we want you to do is we want you to get big, get big and giant. Probably some sort of mechanic lets you grow because you're claiming heritage of giants. Like, whoop. Now, here's a nice thing. Large characters in 5th edition, the way the mechanics work, are almost impossible to balance because a big guy with a sword just does more damage than a little guy with a sword because the weapon gets bigger, we have mechanics for that. But if it's a spellcaster, then things get a little bit different. 
Um, if we give this ability to you at a sufficiently high level, that means multi-classing is a little bit trickier. You can become more of a weapon wielder, but it's gonna be a little of a cost. And we can kind of put some limits on this. Like if it comes in, in like in the double digit levels, it's a little bit harder to just out of the box, out of the gate, just run around swinging a really giant weapon. So that's the first thing. It's gonna be also some sort of elemental, an elemental element as we might say in the pros, you know, <laughs> the, uh, there's an element of the elemental here. So we know we've got fire giants, we know we've got frost giants, we know we have stone giants, we know we have cloud giants. I'm gonna be honest, I, I think I'm gonna skip hill giants here, um, mainly because of the flavor. Hill giants are basically big, dumb dopes. Um, we used to joke that the art in the, the monster manual makes them look like almost a, like a giant angry baby, um, which actually fits because they're not very smart and they're just kind of impulsive and do whatever they want. If you have small children or interact with them, you know sometimes kids can be pretty uh, pretty stubborn. <laughs> and so I'm gonna skip that for now because I don't know if that's necessarily a good flavor uh, match. But again, like I talked about with the Acrobat, this might be something where we do a few of them, we leave some of them blank, we might just concept out one of them as a template, then go back and do the others. And there's also the Storm Giant. The Storm Giant's so kind of funny because we have the Storm Sorcerer that showed up in uh, Xanathar's and also in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. So I'm going to tread carefully with that one. We're probably not going to go into it too much because I'd want to review that subclass and make sure it actually feels different uh, compared to this one. Now, I'm confident we can do that, but I don't want to be like, say, do the Storm Giant first and completely flesh that one out and then find like, oh, I just recreated an existing subclass. Uh, that is one of the tricky things with um, working on the design is sometimes you forget what you've done in other places and then it comes back and it feels like, oh, that's a great idea. And you forget, wait, I use that over here. So... I'm not really gonna to touch this, the, the Storm Giant yet. And then the other idea I had, so I thought about this this idea that, I'm gonna flip my notes, because I did I do think about this, I don't just start doing it live. <laughs> It'll be fun to kind of do that. Maybe, maybe swept some episode, we'll do like an audience participation thing. I'll just take things out of chat and try to make them work, but, but not today. <laughs> um, I also, I wrote down this phrase, uh, and if, you're, if you played third edition, you might remember there was this, uh, a prestige class that did this, and I called it Spell Rage. I kind of like the idea of a sorcerer who goes into like a super saiyan mode and maybe that's tied to like becoming huge or big um that the more giant like you get the more power you transfer like the, you know you just, your spells get stronger and bigger like you get physically bigger so your magic gets bigger and that's just something that we could reflect in what i would i refer to as spell rage uh because why why not let you know sorcerers have fun too barbarians get to rage so why not let sorcerers do it too all right so there we go that's kind of the flavor. Again, we don't need a ton because we're looking at four class features, not having quite the same breadth as the um, the warlock. And when thinking back to the example we used with the, the dragon sorcerer, you know, at first level having things that more enable the style of play, and higher level ones that were dependent on sorcery points, which we don't want to do. So to keep that balanced, we can't go crazy with abilities. Uh, and then uh, a, a feature that was a little it was a nice damage boost, but it's not really something that's like defining your character. All right, so let's start out. What I also need to do is I gotta make sure at least one of these features. Hey everyone, welcome to the Mike Morell's Happy Fun Hour. Uh, each week I take some element of the fifth edition D&D uh, &D game and build something new uh, that we will eventually share on, on Arthur Arcana for playtesting. The purpose of this show is to give you a sense of the design process behind creating new content for D&D 5th edition. And some of the thinking uh, behind the game, why we did things the way we did, and then how we create new content for the future. And I noticed in chat someone asked like, uh, if you could bribe me with, with McRiddles. You definitely can. Uh, McRiddles are one of my many eating guilty pleasures. So if you can somehow set me up with McGriddles, I will definitely probably just do whatever subclass or feature uh, that you want for me from the future. So that's like one of my one of my many culinary weaknesses. So the uh, I, I for my role in the team, I was one of the co-lead designers on Fifth Edition. I did a lot of the initial design, the concepting behind how things work. So it's fun to go back and take a look at uh, the game and see where things are and how we got there. So you might notice right now I've got my handy dandy D&D &D Beyond window open. And I was actually just looking at the wizard class because I wanted to start this week by talking a bit about the wizard and the sorcerer and what we see the difference between the two being and how that feeds into how people feel about the sorcerer. 
Because I think one of the important things is that about working on D&D is understanding that so much of what balance is to players comes down to how do things feel when I sit them next to each other? For instance, if you follow Unearthed Arcana, we did a new fighter subclass called the Brute. I can show you a spreadsheet that proves, I'm going to put proves in quotes, because uh, it doesn't really, but it does if you look at the game a certain way, that the Brute is balanced with the other types of fighters. But what we saw in the playtest feedback, people were really negative about it because it didn't feel balanced compared to the other fighters. The Brute had a mechanic where every time a Brute hit with a weapon, that character just got extra damage. Compare that to the champion who gets more, twice as many critical hits. Now, if I say twice as many critical hits, you think, oh, that sounds great. Because I must get like, I mean, I'm a really good D&D player, so I get tons of crits every, every game session, right? So that sounds great. But in practice, what it means is, rather than critting when you roll a natural 20, you crit when you roll a 19 or 20. Natural 19, natural 20. Mathematically, this doesn't quite balance out. It actually leaves the uh, champion a little, little bit behind the Battlemaster. But when I look at the Battlemaster, the Brute, and the Champion together, they're all basically playing in the same neighborhood. But the important thing is the perception is, hey, if I'm playing a Champion and you're playing a Brute, every time you hit someone, you're rolling an extra die for damage. Which means when you use Action Surge to take an extra action and you hit someone, you're getting an extra die of damage. When you're uh, using multi-attack, you're doing extra damage. That's something that you get all the time. When I crit, yeah, sure, I get I crit twice as often, but I'm only critting 10% of the time. I could, through no fault of my own, though, you know, we I like to joke that rolling is a play is that's your skill as a player in D&D, right? Can you roll high? Um, but you might just roll lots of 18s, right? That's awesome. You're rolling 18. Every time you roll, roll a d20, you're getting an 18. That's great. You're, you're hitting. You're succeeding. But you're not getting that special benefit that makes your character stand out. So it feels weaker. And that's an important part of game design. Uh, it's not just looking at one piece of the puzzle. In this case, a spreadsheet. It's looking at the entire experience. So the entire thing of this sort of preamble is to get into, when we look at the wizard, I want to take a look at the sorcerer and the wizard together. So if you were with us last week, um, we touched on the acrobat uh, subclass for the rogue, and we'll get back to that near the end. I'm going to reverse the order from last week. And then we started to looking at the giant soul uh, option for the sorcerer. And I mentioned early on that we see out there that people aren't necessarily happy with the sorcerer. And they specifically think the sorcerer just doesn't get enough spells. So I'm going to walk you through why I think that is and what that means in terms of how we designed the Wizard and the Sorcerer and, and what that might mean for our Giant Soul subclass that we're, we're going to work on together. The, um, yeah, so actually I have a question here. So, so it, uh, from, uh, uh, oh, uh, Glorious Segfault. I'm imagining that's a Glorious Segmentation Fault, which as a former programmer, I am very familiar with Segmentation Faults. The, um, so is the Brute OP or is the Champion weaker? I think it's actually the champion's weaker because I think not only does getting twice as many crits really maybe not deliver the power you want, it is that element of I could roll very well but not amazing and I never actually feel like I'm getting my ability. And that's not necessarily a place where you want a player to be. Um, because if, you, if you've been with me the past couple weeks, this is our third episode, we talked about subclasses. We talked about especially subclasses that... Um, are really helping to define who your character is. You want a game mechanic that you get to use a lot because that starts to make you feel like I'm thinking like my character. Using the acrobat as an example, we worked up a mechanic where the acrobat gets to kind of do these short burst flies, flight, you know, sort of things that mimic this idea of using parkour, bouncing around. That starts to make you feel like, oh, I'm thinking like my character. I'm gonna look at the situation the dungeon masters narrated to me and I'm going to think, the way we built the mechanic was it was one short flight then a second short flight. So you can imagine your move has been broken up into two pieces. All right, I want to vault over the ogre and then bounce off the wall behind it and then run up the side of the, uh, the opposite wall to get up to this ledge. You're thinking like your character would think. You're looking at the situation thinking, oh, here's what my character would think, here's how my character would read how things are going on, and here's how I would act. The challenge with the champion is that, that key feature, 
you don't get to choose to use it. It just, I rolled the die and it told me, now you get to feel like a champion. And then the further end of it is, well, critting more often, does that really feel like a champion? It almost in some ways makes me think of an assassin or maybe like a swashbuckler feature where I find a gap in your armor with my rapier. It feels a little more elegant. So it doesn't necessarily speak to being what a champion is. Um, and so that's an important part of the design is when you tell someone you're playing a champion, they can think, oh, I know what that means. I can think like that person, so I can portray that person in the game, and then my game mechanics are backing that up by enforcing this idea that I'm going to think like this character, act like that character, and then be mechanically rewarded by having uh, my bonus comes into play at, at a time that feels appropriate. It matches the, 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 the sort of story path I'm going to take my character down. The, um, and so I want to talk a little bit then about the Sorcerer and Wizard in light of all that, that, that preamble, uh, to get at why do people feel that the sorcerer doesn't get enough spells? Now, there's also another sort of kind of important conceptual thing to think of. No one comes to Dungeons and Dragons, especially a new player, thinking, I know how many spells a sorcerer should have, right? We, we don't have magic around us, right? We know that in fantasy, if, you, uh, if you've read any novels or watched movies, there are spellcasters who weave spells. We just know that. And we know that the stronger you are, more skilled you are, probably the more powerful magic you can wield. But the details, we don't really know. So now that's something we're thinking about because we want to make sure that we're not betraying an expectation when we say something. The players go, oh, this is how this character should work. As an example, we say if you're playing a rogue and if you've played MMOs, you've just read novels, you think, oh, this is my character is kind of like a thief sort of person, they should be stealthy or at least I should be able to easily make my character stealthy. So that's something that's kind of coming from outside of the game. But this is something that I feel is clearly coming from within the game. You don't have expectations for how many spells a sorcerer should have, because there's no real common cultural touchstone someone could point to that tells them how many spells a sorcerer should have. So therefore, it's something in our game that's creating this uh, disconnect. The um, question for Humorless Parody, do you think the champion would feel better if there was a way for them to get advantage more often? Yeah, that might be something where if we were to think of a champion, and this kind of goes back to the, um, the concept of feeling like your character. If we refine the champion a bit more to be like you're the party's protector, you champion, you're a champion in the sense of like you're the person at the front line, you're leading the attack, you could, for instance, uh, make a mechanic where if your friend gets hit, you get advantage. So therefore, you can maybe add a little tankiness to it. And you're also telling the champion character, maybe you don't want to be an archer, maybe you want to be someone who mixes it up in close. Now, that might spawn some other issues of, since this is a player's handbook subclass and one that's meant to be easy to play, do you want to tell a player, hey, you've picked fighter, but now maybe you, we kind of told you what type of fighter to play. But it is, you know, it's one of those things where um, you've got to really think through the full player experience. And one of the things we have now, we have four years of experience now almost with the game being released, we can see a lot more of these sort of, I like to think of it as like lower tier, not in the sense they're less important, but in the sense that the game might look fine, then you play it for a year, then you realize, oh, this is something that, that maybe isn't quite working. Or you bring in new players and you're really getting a lot of new players coming in and then you're starting to see a little friction where when you're doing a play test, especially early on with, with fifth, most play tests, the public play test was conducted by you know, people like yourselves. You've been playing D&D for a while probably. Um, we had tests with new players, but that's more a group of four new players have come in, we observe them. They're not going to be able to find all the issues with the classes. It's just not practical. All right, so let's see. I want to go in and talk a little bit about the, the sorcerer and the wizard and the, that perception issue. So the challenge we have is people look at the sorcerer and they say, not everyone, but this is the general trend. Um, sorcerer doesn't get enough spells. So we have to think to ourselves, we, we think this is a problem that's coming because it's within the game itself. Uh, people aren't arriving to that conclusion based on movies or comics or something like that. So let's take a look at the other classes and the immediate comparison is the wizard. Wizard and sorcerer are very similar, not only in how they kind of look, but kind of the role they play in a story. And this is pretty easy using my handy dandy d, &D Beyond links. I can just go right to class features and let's take a look. How many spells do, do, does a wizard get? So if I go down here to preparing and casting spells, well, actually, let's take a step back. Under the spell book, at first level, I get six first level wizard spells. That's a pretty good number, right? It probably lets you take a couple offensive spells, some that are more utility or that kind of speak to your character's nature or background, and maybe a couple defensive spells. 
but that's, that's a fair number, right? Six. That's pretty good. Right? If I said my fighter is walking around with six different weapons, you might even think that might be more than I need. But with a wizard, we know spells, a lot of spells. If you look at the list, things like Charm Person versus Fireball. Well, not Fireball at first level, it's a Magic Missile. Very different use, so you can kind of see how we arrived at that number. We want to give you some variety. So let's take a look at your spell slots here. Okay, you get your spell slots like everyone gets, and you can prepare the um, wizard spells equal to your intelligence modifier plus your wizard level. All right, so at first level, if I have a 16 intelligence, I'm preparing four spells. That's kind of interesting, right? I have six first level spells, four of which I'm going to prepare at first level. Let's assume 16 intelligence, maybe three. Even if you're playing a wizard with a 15 intelligence, if you've said, I want to play... I'm going to choose a character who doesn't get a bonus to intelligence, but I'm going to try to drop my highest stat there. Probably 15 or 16. That's still half. That's pretty good. Uh, a typical player might say, I want to take shield or mage armor, say maybe magic missile or sleep, and then maybe something that's a little tricky, like charm person. And then I know I have a bench of three or so spells, or you know, two or three I can go back to, depending on the nature of the adventuring day. Um, you know, we're back in town, investigating a mystery, I know what spells I want to prep. So we see the wizard has a pretty fair number of spells to start with and can prepare, prepare enough of them to feel that real sense of flexibility. Now the interesting thing about this though is that the number scales up with your level, um, basically one per level, right? It's intelligence modifier plus wizard level, so barring increase, increases to my intelligence score, um, I'm going to be able to prepare one additional spell per level. So I, I don't like to go to 20th level as a comparison point, because that's, that's where things, you kind of already know, 20th level is meant to be a little broken. Um, but let's say at 10th level, by then you probably have an 18 intelligence or 16. You're looking at I have prepared 12 or 13 spells. Um, so in 12 of 13, and then let's take a look at the spell book. And this is why we always look things up, because I'm trying to remember every time I gain a level, I believe I add two spells to my spell book. So I'm just going to confirm that, though, and I'll take a look at chat. I don't know what kind of delay we're on, but if uh, someone in chat wants to chime in, aha, learning spells are first level and higher. Each time you gain a wizard level, you add two wizard spells. So I started with six every time I gained a level, so I've gained nine levels since first level. That's 18 additional spells I've added for free. I got a spell book of 24 spells. That's a lot of spells. Um, I probably have a lot of uh, either... either um, doubling up a lot of like offensive spells because I want to do a lot of energy types or um, adding more and more niche spells knowing that since I can prepare my spells each day I can cover a lot more situations kind of have a core of spells I see as my like, this is how I play a wizard I have my core spells that sort of define my character and I have a lot of more specialized spells that I use as the situation warrants so okay so that's a pretty good number of spells um if we're thinking, you know, a good comparison I like to do sometimes is to think of a trading card game, um, like Mag uh, Magic the Gathering. Um, if I have a deck of 24 cards, that's a fair number of cards. It's not a full-size, a, a typical Magic deck, I believe, is 60 cards. But once you account for land, you're looking more at like 36 cards you're picking, typically. Uh, I'm sure there's people would tell you otherwise, but it's just a basic rule of thumb I've used. Um, so those numbers are kind of looking similar. Um, by the time you get to level 20, you're probably going to be, you know, you're adding 10 more to that. It's not unmanageable, but essentially we're saying it's on the higher level of com the complexity level in terms of how many things to track. So here we go. Let's then compare this to the sorcerer. So I'm going to go back to the top here. Go to my care. Oops, over here to character classes. And go down to the sorcerer. So let's see what the sorcerer is getting in comparison. So let's go to our class features. So everything's very handy dandily linked over here, very easy to navigate. So let's take a look at spells known. Well, okay, first level. Uh, you know two first level spells. So right now we're going, I know two, versus the wizard's six in the spell book and preparing probably three or four. So I'm clearly behind. Um, the interesting thing about knowing two spells too is if we think of a sort of classic three categories, Offense, defense, and utility, I'm probably going to have to choose one category. I just don't have that spell. And then more importantly, I don't have that reserve of my spell book to fall back on. Once I've chosen those, these spells, that's it. So that's pretty straightforward. And then looking at, let's see, so then we have a spells known column. So that's pretty handy dandy. We can see we start at two. 
and we're gaining one spell per level. Now, the challenge here is that's like essentially, well, I'm at half the rate of the wizard in terms of spells I have access to. Wizard's getting two, I'm getting one. In terms of preparation, it's almost the same. The wizard's adding an intelligence modifier where the sorcerer or charisma doesn't, doesn't factor into it. It's just this is the number you get. So you can see now how that's starting to create a real feeling that well, the sorcerer feels really cramped. Uh, when you think of those three categories, when you think of comparing it to the wizard, with the wizard it's almost, I'd almost say with the wizard we might be overly generous. We're giving you a lot of flexibility. And with the sorcerer, you're going from all this space to play with as a wizard to now a very tightly constrained space. It's a very dramatic change. And I, that might be what we're looking at here is the real root problem is the comparison is just so steep. Now, practically speaking, once we get to 10th level, I do have 11 spells known. That's probably enough, right? It's, you know, if we look at it, break it down by level, that's about two per level. I can take, uh, let's say when I hit ninth level, I can take a first, a fifth level spell. And then at 10th, I take a second, fifth level spell. Um, in terms of hitting offense, defense, and more utility spells, I have a little more flexibility. But there is one thing to keep in mind. The sorcerer has a lot of pressure at low levels to take spells that scale up. And here's why. When I'm taking that first spell for my next level, you know, I hit third level, I have access to second level slots, I'm only going to have one second level spell to use them on. If I choose something that's a utility spell, that's all I can use my second level slots on, unless I say chose a spell like Magic Missile, um, that spell that scales well. Or even a spell like Shield, that actually doesn't scale, but it does because it makes an attack miss, which is probably always good. Um, but it does mean that you're spending a lot of time as a sorcerer worrying about your spells. Because you can see that there is essentially a... I'm not going to say correct way to do it, but there's a optimal way to do it, which if you do it optimally, you're going to have a lot more fun than if you make some choices that you end up regretting. So there is a little bit of a landmine here, and with the wizard, we're so generous that you can just ignore that. With the sorcerer, we're so constrained, you have to think about it a lot. So I think that's why we see that, that perception and that complaint about the character class, that you really it's really feast or famine. There really isn't a middle ground. Uh, between these two classes. Uh, it's almost like you know the two edges of like a, a letter U and we're missing the middle ground. So this brings us back to the, um, oh, and someone asked, do you get a, if you pay for D&D Beyond, you get access to more than one subclass? I believe uh, if you buy this, the different resources. So right now I have, this has everything loaded up into it. So it's, it's up to date and current. The, um, but you do have to pay for, for Xanathars and to get access to everything. Uh, I believe, maybe someone in chat will correct me. <laughs> But the, um, but so we're dealing with something where as a sorcerer, you really have to manage this a lot. At higher levels though, and this is where we might now have a, a way forward for our design. You see, if you remember back, way back in the misty days of 2014, 2015, we play tested the Storm Sorcerer. And Storm Sorcery is now in the game. It showed up in the Sword Coast Adventures guide. And we also picked it up for Xanathars. It was fairly popular and people liked the theme. So we just wanted to make sure it was something that was more widely available. Um, originally, this sorcerer at first level got a list of additional spells. We said, oh great, if you play a storm sorcerer, you get some thematic spells like lightning bolt. You just get those for free. Because we knew people were complaining about how constrained the spell selection was. But, you know, in the end of the day, we were really nervous about making that the actual official rule. Because we didn't want to create a sorcerer subclass that seemed so much better than the ones that came before it. And we really didn't want to go back and errata the player's handbook because while the sorcerer's choices are constrained, the class is still balanced mathematically and it's, a, it's not perfect, but we didn't feel the issue was big enough that we had to go back and issue a major errata and then make people feel like they had to buy a new player's handbook. That's always when you think of the balance of the counterweight. We want to make a change. Is it worth going out and telling people, you might want to consider buying a new player's handbook? It has to be a really big change, and it has to have a huge quality of life improvement for everybody, not just for someone who wants to play a sorcerer. 
We also know that people do play sorcerers. It's not a case where just no one's playing the class. Maybe just not as many people. It is also when you look at the perspective on the game, looking at all angles, you can still play a wizard. You might be disappointed that you wanted to do go with the sorcerer, but it didn't, you just didn't want to have to wrangle your spells. Well, then you could turn around and play a wizard, play a similar character, and still have a good time with the game. So it's not perfect, but it's not at a point where we really need to get everyone to go out and update their rule book. But whenever we see a demand where someone's like, hey, I'd like this class to do something along these lines, in this case, have a little more access to spells, we try to meet it. Now, what it means though, is we have to be a little more tactical about what we're gonna do. I think the mistake with the, the storm sorcerer was to just give you a whole raft of spells. I believe that really the sorcerer problem exists mainly at low levels. It's those first couple levels where you just feel like, I'm not getting enough spells, or feel really constrained, I'm not feeling like a powerful sorcerer. I'm feeling like a character who keeps having to make really narrow, really limited choices. And it feels like it's really impinging on my ability to have fun with this character class. So, all that in mind, really less than there being context is everything, especially in game design. Let's take a look at our giant soul sorcerer and let's see if we can solve this issue here. So last time when we took a look, here, I'm gonna put this right over here and put my web browser there. Um, we had this idea that the Giant Soul Sorcerer would have a sub-selection within it that let you pick which type of giant your character would have a connection to. We settled on this idea that uh, the Stone Giant would be a little tougher and tankier, the Fire Giant would be a bit more offensive-oriented, and that the Frost Giant would be a little bit more control-oriented. Now, the... Um, Oh, a question here from uh, Lycan120. Why do you not just release a UA with extra spells? That was something we, th we thought about having an optional rule, but we thought it would cause confusion because it would just create a, uh, it would seem like an instant upgrade for one class. And then we're sort of back in the position of like, okay, everyone who has a player's handbook, here's something we kind of expect you all to have, which, and a lot of times this goes back to a new player, someone coming into the game for the first time. We don't want them to feel like in order to play the game, they then, they bought their player's handbook, they now need to go do a bunch of other stuff. We realize it's not ideal for players, like, you know, people who see this as a problem, hey, solve this problem for me. But we do have to, when we're talking about a, a, anything that's changing the player's handbook, it has to solve a problem for everybody, not just for a subset, uh, just because it can cause confusion or resentment. And so, and like I said, it's a class that's in a kind of a funny position because it is sort of competing with the wizard. So it's not as high a priority. You know, it doesn't carry as much weight um, as say, um, let's just say we had something completely bonkers broken. The fighter had some ability that said, you have plus 10 AC that somehow we horribly messed up and it ended up in print. That would be something we'd look at changing because it might be a big enough magnitude that everyone would be happy to see it changed. Though thankfully, thanks for the play test, <laughs> we didn't have anything that, that messed up show up in the player's handbook. So, what I've done is sort of walk you through this and, and show I think the problem really rests at low levels. What that means is I feel a little bit more confident now introducing a, a, a option as part of this character uh, subclass um, that can give you a few more spells, but it's not going to just be like, here's a bunch more spells. It's going to be a little bit more tactical, and then hopefully if we're doing this right, a bit in flavor for what we're talking about for these characters. And it's going to have to come at the cost of a little bit of power because we know we don't just want to say, Blanket-wise, this subclass is better or more powerful than the other ones. Very well, very well may end up there. We don't want it to be obvious. We want it to be more in the sense of we're as close as we can get to balanced and functional so that our playtest is as productive as possible. So how do we thread this needle? Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. We talked about, and this is actually, now I'm gonna also show this is where I get to feel clever. Uh, <laughs> so we talked earlier about at first level, because you're a giant soul, we feel like, okay, I, I, I like the idea of giving you the plus one hit point per level to make you feel tougher. We're stealing that from the, the, the dragon sorcerer, but I felt like it's also giants and dragons, they're both big, tough monsters. Excuse me. Well, what if instead of doing this AC bonus thing here and plus offense and plus control, we just made this some additional spells we gave you that thematically fit in with uh, the giants. The nice thing here is if we think of, uh, let's just say durability, these are pretty easy things to latch onto as a, as a sorcerer. And at first level, with your spell selection so constrained, you're gonna get a lot of mileage out of this spell. 
So we're just saying you know an additional spell or two. So this is that's the path I'd like to go. I don't think it changes the higher levels yet. And actually, in some ways, it might mean that the higher levels, we might tap into those spells again to encourage you to cast them. But let's take a quick look here. Um, go to our spell list. Just scroll to the top. And oops, OK, I see. I, I made the spell. <laughs> I made the window smaller, so I don't have. Here we go, spells. Artificial spells. Let's go by class. And let's say the sorcerer. I don't know if I want to go so far as to start giving you non-sorcerer spells, but let's start with the sorcerer level. So we're going to take a look at spells by level. Here we go. Let's just look at the first. And let's filter. Boom. All right, so here we go. So what I'm looking for is a spell or two at, say, first and second level. With a, for a stone giant, I want to make you more durable. For the fire giant, I want to increase your offense. And for the frost giant, I want to make you a bit more control. So the idea is, you know, these spells should be thematically time tied to both the giant and that concept. And I'm giving you some more tools to play with. Now, normally, if you, uh, we are giving you more ways to use your spell slots. So it's an existing resource we're giving you more options for. So this is why this probably isn't good enough to sit on its own. It sits alongside the hit point increase. Um, giving people more ways to use their existing resources is really, for most players, they feel like that's not that's somewhat power neutral. Um, if you were here uh, or last week when I talked about the, the sorcerer, the idea of using your sorcery points, having more ways to use them, just doesn't connect with players. Um, that's probably another issue the sorcerer faces a bit, that, as opposed to the wizard, who generally just gets things that add to that character's potency. All right, so taking a quick look. Uh, oh, well, look, Burning Hands. This is easy, right? So for fire, I'm just going to note, let's give you Burning Hands. That's easy. It's a fire spell, and it does a bunch of damage, and it's in a cone. Fantastic. Um, that might be all we need right there. Then taking a look, I want something that's controlly. Ooh, Earth Tremor. Now, oh, this is, that's a little, that, that really fits stone, but it might be, I know it's a spell that's a bit, hey, look, we can just expand it and take a look at it. Um, this is doing bludgeoning damage and knocking people prone. Causes a sort of localized earthquake. Uh, it's not quite hitting the durability note I want for the stone giant, so let's just take a look. Ooh, false life. This might be a nice one to throw in here. 1d4 plus 4 temporary hit points the duration. It makes you tougher. Now you are already getting plus 1 hit point per level, so I'm not going to write that one down yet. Um, but it, that's a candidate. It uh, makes you feel tougher. Um, ice knife. That might be a good spell. Is this controlly? Let's see what we got here. Um, you're doing damage to the initial target if you hit, then doing additional damage in an area around it. The cold thing fits, but it's not quite hitting that control element that I'd like, like to see from Frost. It might be that I can't hit it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. Mage Armor is an interesting choice for the Stone Giant because it's such a useful spell. A lot of players, for them, it's an instant take. Um, and this is essentially giving it to you for free. As a Sorcerer player, you might feel like, mm, this is pretty nifty just to get this right out, right out of the gate. Uh, it's a spell I'm going to use a lot. Um, eight hours basically means I expend one spell slot and then I just keep going the rest of the day using my other spells. So that's one definitely to think of. And then I've got Thunder Wave, and this might be one that I would consider for the Frost Giant. Unfortunately, it is more Thunder and, you know, Thunder Damage theme rather than Frost. It does have a sort of control effect. I'm knocking people away from me. So I'm gonna, just for now, type in Mage Armor here for the Stone Giant. This is one danger you have when you sort of dive into the spell list. You're not always going to find stuff that's like really on point for your flavor. Um, you might have to kind of bend things a bit so people can go, okay, I kind of see what you're doing. Like, for instance, maybe like Ray of Sickness might be, you know, I'm, I'm poisoning someone, but does that really feel like a frost guy? Um, so this is an area where my, because we didn't build the spell list, assuming that I'm then going to come along and build this giant soul sorcerer. Uh, we built it just to create the spells. Um, also, one of the things is I know that Ice Knife is a from uh, the uh, Elemental Evil Player's Companion. Um, and so now what we would do, if we were printing this for a product, uh, we would just pick this spell up, maybe in a sidebar. We only assume you ever own the player's handbook. So, you know, another spell to consider would be Fog Cloud. That can be pretty useful in terms of controlling the battlefield, and it's pretty good utility um, because it does heavily obscure an area. I'm going to pencil it in right now because I can also can kind of see myself feeling like, well, frost has to do with manipulating water. 
fog is, you know, it's fog, it's water vapor. So there's a connection there. So I'm going to put that in there for now. But you know what? One of the things, if you remember, I, when I took a look at the spells, I was really looking at the sorcerer. What if instead we looked at uh, our classes, you know, just spells in general? So what I want to do here is go over to spells and just go to official and let's just go to all spells rather than just looking at sorcerer spells. So now I'm kind of throwing a little bit more of a wider net. Let's look at first level spells and let's filter them. So I'm just going to take a quick look through here. Oh, Armor of Agathis. That's, oh, that's that one to be very nice. Uh, it's got a cold damage on top of it and you get temporary hit points. Um, unfortunately, that, see now this is where we get kind of like, do I want to change my, my, my focus a little bit? I might consider that. But it's, it's, this is an area where it's, it's a little dangerous. This is a very nice thematic feel for like a tougher sorcerer. Um, it's a warlock spell, so you don't normally get it. So it feels even more special. Um, and I have to make sure I'm not just letting, like, oh, cold is control. Like, I'm not letting that drive too much. Um, so I'm going to kind of put that one in my back pocket. But I also don't want to make sure that I'm suddenly making a big design change just based on one spell. I have to see a like, consistent pattern before I might go back and do that. The, um, and I'm going to take a quick, through. hopefully this doesn't give you uh, motion sickness as I flip through. Um, let's go to the second page, see if there are any other spells that show up that really bounce these other, these spells out of the way. Say the Armor Ragathis, you know, it's kind of feeling, maybe I do want to make a change here because I'm seeing spells. Oh, here's what I'll do. I, I think what I want to do is give you first and second level spells. I think I want to keep it to that. I don't think I want to start going up to third because I feel once you've hit third level, you have a pretty good selection of spells, and I'm not as worried about giving you a broader selection of, of magic. Um, but let's see, there's Ice Knife again. Um, Long's Mage Armor, Sanctuary. No, nah, that's not really durability. It's more, it's more of a charm effect. Um, shield's always good, but Shield might actually be too good, but that's, that's a discussion when we talk about spells. Um, sleep, no, nah, doesn't really fit in. Thunder Wave, Unseen Servant, Witch Bolt. All right, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to leave these here for now. I'm not seeing anything that's so awesome. Armor Vagathis is kind of tempting me, but then I'm also not seeing, well, there's that, that Earth Tremor spell for, for, for Stone Giants. Here, let's do this. Let's take a look at our second level spells. Because I've decided I want to give you a first level spell and a second level spell. And let's see what we got there. For our selections. So, Agonizer Scorcher, that's probably a pretty easy one for fire. The nice thing about fire is it is just generally, it's when we think of fire flavor wise, it generally does like lots of damage. So, we got here uh, 30 feet long, 5 feet wide, it's a line, 3d8 fire damage. The one thing that could be a little bit lame here is that you're getting, you know, two spells that are fairly, fairly similar. So, I'm gonna write this one down, but I don't know if I necessarily wanna keep it. One of the tricks when you're building a spell list like this is you want to give players a uh, variety because Burning Hands can scale up with a higher level spell slot. I don't want to just give you Burning Hands and then another take on Burning Hands. For a wizard, this might make sense where maybe I didn't take an AoE spell at first level for my first level spells. Now that I'm third level, I might take Scorcher um, because it just fits in better with my spell selection. The... Um, Let's see what else we got here. Blur, eh, Cloud of Daggers. Let's see, Dark Vision. Let's see, I'm looking for a Stone spell and a Frost spell. The, uh, let's see what we got here. Dra Ooh, Dragon's Breath, eh, just the name. We already have a Dragon Sorcerer. It's a good example of like, I don't think uh, whatever the spell does, it just feels too much like another subclass. It's always good to be aware of what other options exist out there and think about just how does something fit together. Uh, Dust Devil might be one for a Cloud Giant, but we're not tackling that yet. Ooh, Earthbind. Oh, uh-oh. Okay, so this is going to take away someone's flying speed. Uh, this is one which, it sounded cool, Earthbind! Oh, it's like something kind of cool with rocks. It might be the Stone Giant, but it's, it's this is clearly a spell designed for, uh, for, for wizards. Uh, yes, a sorcerer could take this, but you're taking one of your few spells and saying, I can shut down your fly speed. It's pretty specific. This is probably not what I want to do. I don't want to give this spell to you to make you feel like you have more flexibility. <laughs> if I give you this spell, here's more flexibility. You can make people not fly. Kind of telling you that I don't like you, right? I'm giving you stuff you don't want. <laughs> so uh, enlarge, reduce might be one to look at, but I think this, the spell rage is already going to capture that. Uh, and I don't know which giant I'd give it to, like all of them. 
Uh, maybe we'll see. Well, I'm going to get to the end of this list and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. Oh, Flaming Sphere. Here we go. This is a fun spell. I love Flaming Sphere. It's one of my absolute favorite spells um, because it's a damaging spell that's also got a little bit of a control element to it. And so I don't have to just give you Burning Hands and Burning Hands 2.0. Good afternoon, Twitch, and welcome to the Mike Merles Happy Fun Hour. I am your host, Mike Merles. I am the creative director on Dungeons & Dragons, and I will be guiding you through the design of a new subclass for a different character class of Dungeons & Dragons each week. So as you can see up on our screen right now, we have two things. First, we have our notes from last week on our giant soul sorcerer. And on the left of the screen, at least as far as I'm looking at it, we have our handy dandy browser open to dndbeyond.com, which we'll be using as our reference throughout the show as we work on our subclass. Uh, and that reminds me of one of my tips. I'll probably re repeat this multiple times each week. So if you've heard it before, you're going to hear it again. When you're working on anything with D&D or any other role-playing game or any other system you're working on, Never assume you remember details correctly. Always look things up. Always tread cautiously and carefully before moving ahead with your design. And always verify that what you think is true is actually true. So, uh, let's take it away. So last week, we worked on the giant soul. Um, we talked a bit about the sorcerer. And I'm, I'm introducing a little bit of a change. We're going to try something a little bit different this week. Because I felt like, I mean, I really enjoy doing the show. But I also wondered how much of the show were you watching me look through spell lists to pick the right spells that we were going to give to the giant soul sorcerer. So we're going to do something a little bit different with the next subclass, which we're going to talk about this week. Um, but we'll get to that when we get to it. And um, so, yeah. the uh, Oh, and I see Soul Splice uh, V or 5. Mr. Don't worry about calling me Mr. Merles. I'm just Merles. Or you can call me Mike. The, um, I'm, actually, I shouldn't say I'm not that old. I am that old. So I guess if you want to call me Mr. Merles, that's okay. But, um, being now that I'm in my 40s, I guess that's who I am, whether I like it or not. So, um, yeah, let's take a look at the giant soul. Now, I haven't really worked on this much since last we met. And what I wanted to do here was just do a quick review to show you where we are. Because I think what's going to happen next, you know, I thought a little bit about what I wanted to do this week. And I think we put enough work into this one that what I'm going to do is probably for next week, uh, take these notes and then kind of show you how it turns into the next step of text. Um, because I feel like in looking through this um, with the giant soul, we're in a solid place. It really does need to be play tested. Now, if you weren't with us last week, one of the big points we talked about, and I'm going to highlight it, is this first level uh, class feature. We know from playtest feedback that people feel that the sorcerer is just being sold short a bit on spell selection. But we also know that at one point in this playtest of the, the storm sorcerer, we gave the storm sorcerer a bunch of extra spells to augment that list. The feedback though was it really made the player's handbook sorcerer uh, subclasses feel very weak. So we didn't want to just repeat that. We want to address the issue, but we want to address it in a very specific targeted way that makes the new subclass, in this case the Giant Soul, where we're doing this, feel balanced, feel reasonable. We don't want people who are playing the existing Sorcerer subclasses to feel left out. So what we ended up doing was taking a look at the low levels of a Sorcerer, and it really looked like, now we can't say for sure, we can only verify this through playtest, but we felt that it was at the low levels that the sorcerer was really feeling that spell selection pinch. Um, having only two spells at first level really just felt like you didn't have that flexibility that you might want in a spellcaster, especially if you're playing a campaign where you're expecting to see a wide variety of challenges. So what we settled on was, in addition to giving, giving you the dragon sorcerer type hit point boost, um, basically plus one hit point per level, to reflect the sort of innate toughness you'd expect from a giant. We also gave each of our different giant types a couple of additional spells uh, at low levels to help bridge that gap. And what we wanted to do was make these spells feel thematic for the type of giant, and then to build that sort of mechanical ladder, that theme that runs through the subclass that really tells you this is why this sorcerer is distinct from other sorcerers. 
So that's where we, that was like, that's really the big lesson to take away from here is in thinking of designing things for an existing game to really have an understanding of how is the game currently functioning? How do the players think of that function? Are they happy with it? Do they see it has a shortcoming? And then to consider if you want to try to make an improvement, because that's, that's a dangerous word in dealing with subclasses, improvements, because when we improve things, we make them better. And if you've played any game, you know that often if we make things uh, too good, uh, too much better, if that's uh, proper phraseation, uh, it leads to things being broken. Now in Dungeons and Dragons for 5th edition, we consider things to be broken if, th for players at least, if a player selecting the option makes the other players at the table feel ineffective or overshadowed. It's okay if that's within a character's area of specialization. If the fighter has the best armor class at the table, we're okay with that. But if the fighter's armor class is so high that that character never takes a hit unless it's a crit, then maybe we feel like you're starting to overshadow people. So it's that line between feeling like my character is really good at this and then feeling like my character's too good at this. And often we find that really comes down to perception that we can mathematically prove, or at least as much as you can mathematically prove anything in a role-playing game, that something's output is similar to something that came before, but if it feels too good, then that can cause friction. Because d and is a cooperative game rather than a competitive game, that feel, that idea of teamwork, that idea of people feeling they're coming together to play the game rather than coming together to oppose each other, uh, it's important that fairness in some ways overshadows balance for D&D. So that's where we left off in talking about the giant soul. For a quick recap, we had at first level, we increased your hit points, we gave you a couple of spells. Then we came into the sixth level, this idea of the, um, the sort of spell rage concept. It starts out at sixth level with this idea that whenever you cast a spell, you get some benefit based on its slot. So if I cast a second level spell, I would get a benefit saying, okay, it's, it's for second level, it's better than if the benefit I get for casting a first level spell. And this was the idea that truly really make each giant feel distinct and also give you a benefit that really pop up quite often. And then at 14th level, this idea of the spell rage then going from a constant benefit from your spells to this idea of I can actually become size large and then I get a raft of benefits with that. Then at 18th level, allowing you to become size huge, for you to literally become a giant um, at 18th level. So that's where we settled on that. Um, and this is actually a, a subclass, and I mentioned this, you know, I think last week. I, I'm really curious to get this one out into playtesting, because I'm I really want to know how do people feel about this? That we're giving you a couple of extra spells. It's not quite to the same extent that the storm sorcerer went, but it also is. It, we, I am treating this essentially as a, uh, a class feature. You know, I, the other uh, sorcerers, especially the dragon sorcerer, they get an armor class boost at this level. We're replacing that armor class boost with a couple more spells. So it's going to be very interesting to see how people react. Do they feel, is this fair? Um, is it balanced? Is it interesting? Is it worth it? Um, or is this just really patching a hole and people really feel like they're, they're not coming out ahead of the game at least ahead of the game to the extent they'd expect to after picking up their first subclass features. So I'm going to take a quick peek into chat, see, let's see, what have we got any questions coming in through here? Um, if anyone wants to throw something up there, because I'm about to roll out, uh, I'm going to move away from the giant soul sorcerer uh, and then move to our new, our new subclass we're going to show off. And like I said, it's a little bit of a, something different. The um, I decided that, well, I want to try this, right? This is in the spirit of game design. We're going to experiment a little bit. Rather than necessarily watch me do a lot of typing, this week there's going to be a, a lot more commentary. The um, Oh, so a question from Todd, Todd Kenner. Okay, Todd. Uh, why not large at sixth level? So my main worry here is when we think of multiclassing, um, letting you become size large, it's probably going to make you really good in close combat. That would just flavorful, flavor-wise, that's what we'd expect. A sixth level, though, makes it a little maybe too easy for uh, a barbarian or a fighter to dip into this to get those benefits uh, and then stack them up with their already you know, impressive uh, combat abilities. Really want this to feel like there's the sorcerer is shifting modes 
and maybe acting in a way the sorcerer normally doesn't. What that means is those benefits have to be really big to get you from being more of the backline caster to muscling your way up to the front and smacking down monsters. Those benefits, if I give them to a sorcerer, might make the sorcerer an effective close combat character. Giving them to a barbarian or a paladin might make that character very powerful. So by planting those at 14th level, you can still go ahead and multi-class. I believe at 14th level, and this, hey, we're going to check. What did I say earlier? I can't exactly remember where it is the fighter and uh, barbarian. Um, oops. I want to go. Oh, you know what? I'm going to go to full screen mode because actually I'm so used to using this in full screen mode that when I, when I go. So let's take a look at the fighter. So at 14th level, as a sorcerer, let's take a peek. When does the fighter get their additional attacks? And they get them at 5th level. So in theory, at 5th level there, I can reach, you know, at 19th level, I can combine the 14th level feature with those extra attacks. I'm, I'm willing to let you do that. At that level, all the characters are kind of supposed to be broken. We'll talk about that later. It's not really necessarily a topic for right now, but I'm okay with it. At 6th level, though, that means I could reach 14th level as a fighter. So I'm looking at um, I got my second extra attack has come online now, and I'm stacking that, so I'm getting three attacks, and I'm stacking that on top of a, a size increase. That just might be too good at that 17th level area. It just, you know, it's one of those things where it just might be too appealing to, to characters, especially for the Paladin. Um, so let's do another quick look. Let's see. All right, so I think we're good here. The, um, oh, uh, Kikirida, uh, or I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, Acrobat's a little bit, um, I've been struggling with a little bit, so I'm going to be honest, I've been distracted by other shinier things. And so why not, uh, I'm, I'm not going to beat around the bush, let's show you the shiny new thing I want to show you this week. 